You may have sacrificed for a noble cause, spent your time in seeking humanity's applause. Others have made long journeys to strange and distant lands, all searching for the answers in the heart of man. I too have tried in vain to be good enough for him, not knowing I could never make the payment for my sin. But God in heaven came to me and used the Spirit's sword. He answered all my questions in his word. Nothing but the blood for me to take away my sin. I kneel beneath the fountain that cleanses deep within. Nothing but the blood for me, the past racing flood of justice and mercy found in nothing but the blood. My heart and he is yielded to his call, my soul has found its wings. My mind is drinking in the peace that knowing Jesus brings. Still many grope in emptiness, a place I live so long. If only they could sing with me this song. Nothing but the blood for me to take away my sin. I kneel beneath the fountain that cleanses deep within. Nothing but the blood for me, the past racing flood of justice and mercy found in nothing but the blood. Amen. I was discouraged when no answer came. See, I prayed for years and I still saw no change. I was ready to give up on my prayer coming true. But when I prayed the last time, his power broke through. Prayer's just as big as God is. Prayer's just as strong as God is strong. Prayer can reach as far as God can reach. Don't ever give up, just pray. We have been given the keys to the throne, but the ones whose potential is yet to be known. There are no limits as to what God can do. So just keep on praying, he's listening to you. Prayer is just as big as God is. Prayer is just as strong as God is strong. Prayer can reach as far as God can reach. Don't ever give up, just pray. Don't ever give up, just pray. Just pray. That's all. Just pray. Easy to say, right? Sometimes it's hard to do. Man, you have your Bibles. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to read 16 verses. Yes, we are. Comment on them like a little commentary. And to end up in verse 16, which our title is Redeeming the Time. And... Uh, we need to understand uh, when we're reading these things that words are important. Every word of God is pure. And uh, let's pray. Father, we need clarity of thought, liberty of speech. Uh, Father, we wish uh, everybody wasn't sick and was here uh, to hear the messages, Father, that uh, we preach and we prepare. And uh, God, but uh, we're here. And so, Father, I pray that you'd uh, allow us to glean from your scriptures, understand some things. And, Father, where we fall short, that we'd be able to uh, get back on course. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 1 says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. We also know in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Paul says, Be ye followers of me as long as I'm following Christ. Uh, Paul, the apostle, also penned this uh, epistle. Uh, the Bible says, And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. And so the definition of uh, the love that it says walk in the love is the love that Christ also hath loved us. When he said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. That type of, type of a thing is uh, <clears throat> what we're talking about. And hath given himself for us an offering, a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. 
verse 3 says, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, that's it was always wanting what you see no matter what, don't care what God says or anything, you're going to get it. That's why they got credit cards, right? Not work for it, but just get it on loan. And uh, we've all are guilty of that. But covetousness is some bad news, and it's in this list too. And uh, what usually takes place is uh, we got uh, <laughs> we got a thought comes about first of these things that we're going to be seeing. It's listed. The thought comes first, then the spirit behind the thought, and that's the scary part. Every thought has a spirit behind it, like the words that we speak. And uh, so it says, but fornication, all uncleanness, and or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become as saints, which means this can be named among you. He's saying, don't let it. And But he adds also, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather given of thanks. For this ye know, that no, and it goes through a list again, no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, uh, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Inheritance in that area. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. You see this? So that verse 5, all those things that we just listed right there, these are, are what uh, causes the wrath of God to come upon the children of disobedience. And the children of disobedience are the, are the devil's kids. And uh, so when... A, a child of God is disobedience. We don't get the wrath of God, but we definitely get the chastisement of God upon us. And uh, that's why verse 7 says, Be not ye there for partakers uh, with them. So redeem the time. Uh, the enemy robs our time by emotion, then takes uh, the mind over, and then next thing you know, our actions follow. So everything is darkness. Everything in the scripture right now, so far that we're reading, is talking about the darkness side, right? Not the light. Uh, because uh, you know that you're in darkness when you're bored, right? When you're bored with things of the light. Uh, something has captured your mind. Something, uh, you ha you got expectations of something else. And when you hear the word of God, you hear things about the word of God. That's light, light. And people that can, are supposed to be saved, and, and all of a sudden it's, it's boring to them to hear something preach. And Well, it's not lively. It's not this or that. Well, you're supposed to give attendance to reading, and you're supposed to give attendance to the things of God. And God says, preach the word, be in season, out of season, rebuke, and all those things uh, that are taking place. That's just part of our makeup as Christians is to be disciplined enough to be able to take the word of God. If it's boring, it's because it's not interesting to you. Uh, therefore, what would make it interesting? Some lights, maybe, drums, music, and all this kind of stuff, all these trappings, and uh, that's not the way it goes. Uh, what God says goes, period. If it's boring to you, you need to get right with God. Uh, I'm telling you, uh, there's a lot of things that we've read already that would stop us and destroy us and keep us in darkness. Uh, why? Because there's spirits with those thoughts. And we allow them bad thoughts to go in there and take root. The next thing you know, our emotions are affected by them thoughts. And if our emotions are affected by our thoughts, we ain't thinking right at all. We're not thinking right. So we're going to end up having some problems. That's why Paul says, Be not therefore partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Uh, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Proving it. <laughs> a lot of things we do, we may have questions about. So you go to scriptures, you talk to God, you say, is this right? Maybe it's not mentioned in scripture. Maybe it's not a bad thing. You still ask the Lord, you say, if the, you know, give me some peace on this. If, this, you know, if, if, if you're not giving me any conflict or anything, I'm going to go ahead and go this way or do this thing. And uh, the Lord will let you know. That's, that's making honest moves for the Lord. And you need to be honest with God. You need to uh, do that uh, when you're proving what's acceptable unto the Lord. Because the other stuff we already know is not acceptable. So we're not even going to try to prove that, right? We know when we mess up. We know what we see. We know what we hear. We know the things that are bad. We're not going to try to prove that. We don't have to prove that. We already know it's not acceptable to God. If you're saved, you do. And uh, then verse 11 Verse 10 is talking about proving something. And verse 11 is telling you now not only prove it, but now your physical condition, right? 
who you fellowship with. <laughs> Verse 11 says, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather what? Reprove them. How are you going to do that? With the light. It's darkness. Darkness, darkness, darkness is reproved by light. The word of God is light. Jesus is light. Jesus is the word of God. So uh, who you hang with is, is something you should consider. And, uh, and also, uh, we're going to find out you don't talk about it. You don't talk about those dark things. You may know dark things. You may know dark things about other people. You may have read things that are dark or saw things that are dark. You don't talk to people about darkness. You don't bring it up. Why? It's bad news. That's why. If you're a child of the king, you don't need to be bringing that stuff up because when you bring it up, it's in your mind. And it, and it possibly was in your mind. That's why you brought it up. And when you just defile everybody with that stuff, we don't need to hear about darkness. We're children of the light, not darkness. And so you need to prove what's acceptable. You need to have no fellowship with the works, works of darkness, but reprove them. Say, this is wrong, that's wrong, this is wrong, that's wrong. You don't try to defend them. That's what's wrong with all the psychology and all this junk nowadays. They're trying to make excuses for everything. Verse 12 says, For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. My goodness, everybody's out of the closet now. I mean, you're talking about it on TV, books, uh, making kids read books uh, that have all that stuff in it. I mean, nobody's safe. Nobody's safe. I'm telling you, as a Christian, you have to know what to do and what not to do. You can refuse things, you know. Still got a freedom to do that. And uh, verse 13 says, But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore, he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee what? Light. Talking to Christians. Not talking about people that are lost. Saying, Wake up, man. Wake up. Christ will give you light on that thing. He'll, he'll put batteries in your flashlight, amen? You'll be able to see where you're at. It ought to scare you. You ought to want to get out of that. Christ will also give you power to get out of those things. And uh, you've got to have them. Verse 15 goes along with the, the whole topic there. He says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. What does that mean? Well, wise son's going to walk in the light, not darkness. You're not going to be foolish. You're going to look around and you're going to see things that aren't right. You don't walk towards those things. You don't walk with people in those things. You don't talk about those things. If you're already infected by it, it's already occupying your mind and your emotions, you mark it down. Your body's next in line to do whatever it's going to be doing. you got to watch yourself. you got to guard yourself. And uh, uh, stop taking for granted the Word of God. When you sit there, if there's something crosses your mind that's wrong, you Man, right there you ought to just say, Lord, I'm sorry, man, that's right. You, that's absolutely right. I keep thinking about this or that or the other thing or something maybe got a hold of your brain, you know? Things get a hold of us. And when they do, that's that power of that devil trying to mess with us. And there's no power on earth greater than what we have in us. So we have to understand that we're children of the light, not darkness. So when we're affected by the darkness, we're being controlled by the darkness, that is not normal. No. Because our body is supposed to be dead and we're supposed to reckon it dead. So what it's doing is it's telling the new man, the new creature, that uh, tough, I'm going to live over here like the old man. No, no, no. God put that in the grave. And you've got to stop going over there and living there. You've got to say, I'm going to seek those things which are above. I'm going I'm to read this book, Things That Are Light. I want to manifest the darkness. And myself, I'm going to start reproving the darkness. You know, the more you reprove stuff like that, you make other people aware of how bad it is. I mean, can you imagine all those, those females killing babies? That's so unnatural. But they're so afraid of society or their parents even or anything. They don't want to, you know, because of the relationship, they don't have a father, so they're just going to kill the baby. There's something took them over because it violates everything uh, that God has created that woman for. Unnatural affection. That's emotion. So them emotions are running that person. And because they run that person, you do some weird acts. Because you're not thinking. The mind ain't controlling them. Emotions control them. 
See, when the emotion controls your mind, you got a problem. The Spirit of God's supposed to be controlling us. So that's the day and age that we're living in. And redeeming the time is very important. That's why towards the end of the chapter, after all this stuff that God has just said, he says in verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are what? Evil. Now, that was in 62 AD this was written. It hadn't changed. Since Adam sinned, the days have been evil. God's wanting everybody to redeem the time. And uh, you think about that. I got some little things here on redeeming the time. And speaking of time, time spent in, seven, in a 70-year life. If one lives to be 70 years of age and is the average person, <laughs> he spends 20 years sleeping, 20 years working, 6 years eating, 7 years playing, 5 years dressing, 1 year on the telephone, 2 and a half years smoking, Two and a half years in bed, three years waiting for somebody, <laughs> five months tying shoes, two and a half years for other things, including a year or a year and a half in church. I mean, what a thing. Somebody actually took time to do this. I'm sure he's got a mean, you know, not everybody, but most people. That's what gonna, it's going to amount to. And uh, how much time do you spend in church? Well, to spend one and a half years in church in a relative lifespan of 70, one must, on the day of his birth, begin to spend five minutes of each morning and every evening in devotions, plus three hours per week in church. Now, that's from his birth. Well, you know, from the birth, kid ain't going to do nothing like that. So you got to wait till he's able to comprehend some things. So you're already going in a deficit you know, with the Lord and how much time you spend in church. And that's if you go to church. And uh, I remember one time using this, and, and it's interesting if you can get it on a board or over, over uh, one of those things uh, to put on there, but uh, there's a Dr. Leslie. We're talking about breaking down lifetime in minutes. In other words, when you're at a certain age, it's, it's like a clock. And before you check out, it's like a certain age equals an amount of time on your clock of life. Uh, Dr. Leslie Witherhead, in his book, Time for God, has mathematically calculated a schedule which compares a lifetime of three score years and ten with the hours of a single day from seven in the morning to eleven at night. So if your age is 15, teenager, the time is 10.25 a.m. So if you put a clock up there and you said, this is my life, already you're at 10-something a.m. in the morning, you see? Uh, 20 years old, the time is 11.34 a.m. 25 years old, the time is 12.42 p.m. At age 30, the time is 1.51 p.m. See, if you had this in front and you're looking at a clock, you're saying, oh, my goodness, that means I'm checking out at midnight. <laughs> I'm dying at midnight, you see. And uh, chap, uh, anyway, uh, uh, 30 years old, the time is 1.51 p.m. At 35, the time is 3 p.m. At 40 years old, the time is 4.08 on your life clock. At 45, the time is 5.16 p.m. At 50, the time is 6.25 p.m. At 55, the time is 7.34 p.m. At 60, the time is 8.42 p.m. At 65, the time is 9.51 p.m. And at 70, the time is 11 p.m. What's next? Death. So guess what? Right now, I'm on borrowed time. John and Brother Suver are like, whoa, tons of borrowed time. So the normal life at 70, see, if we had that, if we were brought up disciplined and we looked at that thing, it, it, may, it may sort of promote us or push us to do more things in the time that we have. And uh, I'm old and I'm past that. I could try to redeem some of the stuff. It's difficult, though, when you're set in your ways and your mind uh, is getting older and it's just hard to do things and remember things. 
But you think about the time wasted. My goodness. When you look at time, and God says, redeem the time, for the days are evil. Um, very important to consider those verses. And if somebody's young, listen to me, or a teenager, young adult, you need to statistically figure out your life and say, oh, my goodness, I better get busy, huh? Yeah. Um, once again, the clock of life. It's a selected poem, I guess. The clock of life is wound but once, and no man has the power to say just when the hands will stop, at late or early hour. Now is the only time we own to do his precious will. Do not wait until tomorrow, for the clock may then be still. Man. I don't know about you, but uh, the study of uh, what we just preached on, probably can take a few years just on that chapter alone and uh, delving into the sin the, you know with the covetousness and all these different things and and just by God saying walk circumspectly to define that word you know is looking all around you and making sure you're doing the right thing and you could go sub point after sub point in the word of God with scripture uh, that tells you to put on Christ take off Christ be full of the Holy Ghost uh, these verses that uh, that actually God is commanding us to do, not a suggestion, and we violated so many years of misplaced time that, uh, I mean, you get under conviction just thinking about it. Uh, well, guess what? We, we don't have too much time for conviction. We need time of resolution. We need time to really, when you get up in the morning, think about talking to God, Think about giving them uh, some place in your life with reading scripture and increased reading the scripture. And I told, I think it was John before, it doesn't matter how hard it is to read, you put your eyeballs on that page and let God, let God show you. You'd be amazed how God, because it's his word, uh, he's invested in you. I mean, he died for you on Calvary and uh, he wants you to know things. He wants to, to empower you. He wants to clean up your brain and stuff and the Bible talks about the water, the washing of the word. Uh, we've got to have that. And so let God worry about what you understand and what you don't. I don't know how many times I read the scriptures, and I, I really try to, uh, I don't know, I'm not that great of a grammarian, and I don't know about syllables a whole lot, but I, I try to somehow pronounce some of them whew, Bible words. But every time I do, it's like different sounding. But uh, even when I listen to Scorby, He'll say it one way and somebody else will say it another way and they'll argue over who's right, right? And I'll just say, well, God knows. I'll mention that name. He knows who it is. And we know that that character is in the story that we're preaching or teaching about. So there should be no confusion, just the mispronunciation of the name. But we, nevertheless, we do. We don't stop preaching because of that or teaching or learning or reading the Bible just because we can't get a name down. Let me tell you, God's interested in, in what we're interested in. And if we're interested in him, he'll let you know what he feels like and what he doesn't. That's why we go through so many things in our mind. I mean, I have all the scriptural answers, but applying them, we forget. We forget to just relax, calm down, and ask God for help. How do you redeem the time? God will show you. Or you just ask him, say, God, make me... Give me a sense I'm doing something wrong, like sin, if, if I'm wasting my time doing something. You know, if I'm wasting my time doing something. Uh, we talked about uh, prayer, and, and a lot of times we think that, oh, it's just prayer. No, 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 no. According to this Bible, it's powerful. So there's a whole lot of people today, uh, elderly people, they know they can't do the certain things they used to do, so they get a, a prayer list. They get them a little pad, you know, paper, and they put down the names, like we do on Wednesday for our personal problems. Well, you just, you get, get a prayer list going somewhere. You know, check it twice or whatever. That's being faithful to God, praying for people. And you can actually don't tell people for some things, maybe you're praying for them to clear up in their, in their walk with God, and then when you see it clear up, you know that you have something to do with it. They don't, but you know. So it's between you and God that makes you happy. It's like Ronnie. You pray for him to get saved. You pray for John to get genuinely saved. I don't care how much Bible they know. They need to get born again and saved if they're not. 
and uh, you just pray and you wait. You pray how to do this or go there, or, you know, or, or, you know, who you support. I mean, after all, this is just time. I mean, when Brother Silver, Brother John, or myself, or anybody, when we go to heaven, that's it. There ain't no more down here. There's no more down here. So it's what you've done here that's going to, that for Christ is what's going to last. So if souls were important for God because God the Father sent his son, his son is the first missionary, right, to the world. What does he do? He gives the gospel. What happens? People receive it and they get saved. So you tell me what's more important than that. Uh, an, an addictive uh, boy is more important than that? Or even a wife or anything? What's more important than God and God's word? Nothing. Why? Because the benefits are over yonder. So when you look at the map, what can I do to get these folks saved? Well, you got to support mission. You got to think about that, right? I mean, I don't know what else to tell people if they're saved. What do you think this is? This is <laughs> you're not going to be here long. You belong to the Lord. So how in the world, what can you do to help the Lord? That's the way you look at it. And uh, people, a lot of times, they just they let that emotion go. They let fi family ties. I mean. I mean, it's just like uh, Nehemiah. We pray for Nehemiah now. If he was, if he's back on something, I gonna give him a bunch of money. Why? He'll go over there and he'll blow it on that stuff. Well, at least he'll know I love him. No, he won't. He loves what he's he's putting his putting in himself more than you. If that wasn't the case, they would be more sympathetic to you. They'd love you. They'd visit you. They talk with you. They do this. They do that. They don't have that. They don't have the natural affection. Whatever's whatever they got in their brain, and everything is done. Took them over. They're not serving God. They're not helping God. I'm telling you. Trump is not the cure. God is the cure. We pray that God will use Trump. We pray that he'll use all those people, but God's the cure. You know, so we need to keep that in mind of who we serve, who saved us, who do we belong to. And, yes, we love our family. I love all the kids, grandkids, and everything like that. But by me loving God and serving God, he takes care of that. If I was to take my focus off of him and put it all on them, all my energy, then I got a problem. Something's going to happen to me for doing that, and it may be result in something happening to them that wouldn't have happened. So what do you do, preacher? Support God, love God, pray. Watch God work in people's lives. Pray before you do something. You know, pray about it. Get the peace of God. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. We're living in the last days for sure. We don't need to be messing up now. Amen? Okay, let's pray and go to God.